wouldn't mind, open your Bibles to Song of Solomon tonight. We will be finishing up the book, the Song of Solomon, chapter 7. It's been a great ride. So Lord, we thank you for this evening, and we thank you that we can be here tonight to rejoice and to sing, Lord, from the bottom of our hearts to the top of our lungs, Lord God. We're not ashamed of the gospel. Lord, we cry out tonight, there's a lot of confusion going on, but we thank you, Lord, that you have reminded us that you are on the throne. As we review, Lord God, you have simply gotten us through the bird flu, no big deal. You got us through the Ebola outbreak, Lord, not a problem for you. The swine flu, the Spanish flu, Lord. Now, what's new? The coronavirus? We are not afraid, Lord, and we know that you are guiding us. And so, as we even look through scripture, Lord God, you protected your chosen people, even from the plagues that were poured out on the Egyptians. We fear not, Lord. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, in that reality, we want to be a stable neighbor for our neighborhood. We want to draw the attention completely to Jesus Christ. We want to be allowed, Lord God, to help calm people's fears. It's all unmerited, Lord. You know that. We know that. Now use us as vessels, Lord. Use us to bring the good news. Hey, God is in charge. He has got all this under control. So why don't we just continue to submit to him and allow him to have his way. And we'll be amazed how many people will find comfort in those words. So, Lord, when the opportunity comes, give us the words. But in the meantime, Lord, let us rest in your goodness tonight as we continue and we conclude, I should say, conclude the book of Song of Solomon, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, so much for this precious, wonderful book. We ask you to teach us tonight, Holy Spirit. And Father God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And we say, Amen. Amen. Song of Solomon, chapter 7. Thank God we're, we're wrapping up. And it's the honeymoon and beyond tonight. And I kind of sound like the Toy Story, Buzz Lightyear. I, my wife and I just watched uh, Toy Story 4 the other night. So I guess that was in my head. And I, I said, Lord, how do I title this? Honeymoon and beyond. Yeah, way to go, Buzz. <laughs> Still Woody, he's the coolest, though, isn't he? Sheriff Woody. <laughs> We start off tonight with the beloved. The beloved. How beautiful are your feet in sandals? And so this is Solomon looking at his beloved bride. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter? I mean, she, we remember that she was a, a, a woman of the, of the soil, if you will. She wasn't from a royal line, but when Solomon gazed upon his wife, he said, oh, you're just as beautiful as a prince's daughter. And you're mine. You're mine, Solomon is saying. And he continues on. The curves of your thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of a skillful workman. Your navel is a round, rounded goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. And so certainly this is the honeymoon time when Solomon is... The, for the first time, casting his gaze on his love. And he is just taken in by her beauty and by her structure, by her physical appearance. Your waist is a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Now, ladies, if your husband begins to start complimenting you in this regard, know that he's been studying this letter. Okay, and so don't, don't you know, encourage him. Don't discourage him. Don't discourage him. He's coming right from the poet here, right from, from Solomon. So just accept the compliments as, as, they, as they come. Please don't disregard this, okay? Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes like the pools in Heshbon by the gate of, ba of bath Rabim. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. Now, these poetic explanations are just coming from, from Solomon's heart. 
And he is seeing his bride, and he is just overtaken with her. This time that he has waited for her, and now she is presenting herself to him visually for the first time in this particular case. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. And, your, and the hair of your head is like purple. And the, the original idea here, the hair of your head is like purple. It's really the Hebrew is saying your hair, it looks like it just flows like water. It's, it shimmers. It's kind of waving, if you will. And that's the idea here. So, so the hair of your head is like purple. A king is held captive by your tress. And so Solomon is saying, you've arrested my attention, man. I can't get my eyes off of you. How fair and how pleasant you are. Oh, love with your delights. This statue, this stature of yours is like a palm tree. And just uh, the idea here is just you stand straight. You're not bent over. You're, you're young and beautiful. And so you, your stature is like a, a straight palm tree. You, 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 my, my aunt used to tell my cousins, my female cousins, okay, chin up, chest back. I used to hear her say that a couple times to my cousins. And we used to tease, you know, the boys used to tease, tease our girl uh, cousins, you know. Okay, I, I, I saw your shoulders slacking, you know, so we give them a hard time. But that's the idea. You know, you're, sta you know, you're standing like a, straight like a palm tree with your, your chin up and your, and your shoulders back. You look wonderful. Your breasts are like its clusters. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. And so Solomon is now approaching his bride. <laughs> Let now your breasts be like clusters of the vine. The, pra the, the fragrance, fragrance of your breath like apples and the roof of your mouth like the best wine. And so this is the honeymoon. I mean, what a joy. And so he's discovering. And, and, and the night of the honeymoon should be a night of discovery in this regard. This is God's word. So we don't have to be embarrassed or shy about it. We understand as we've been going through this book that this is the Lord's design in marriage. And so what a joy. And so Solomon concludes his thoughts. Now the Shulamite, she responds. And she's looking at her beloved and she respond, responds, the wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, for my man. It, the wine goes down smoothly, moving gently the lips of the sleepers. And so several things here, and it's a little difficult to totally capture the original Hebrew idea. But the way I, the Lord was kind of showing me through much study and, and, and studying other uh, postures of other great commentators that we all respect very much. A couple of ideas here. One of the ideas, the Shulamite is looking at her husband, and he's there with the, a glass of wine, and he's just a handsome guy. And, he kinda, and she sees him, and he kind of takes that glass of wine and puts it to his lips, and he, he does it very smoothly, because that's just the way he naturally is. And so she sort of sees him and catches him maybe in a certain light coming through the window. And there he is putting that glass of wine to his lips. And she just says, man, the glass of wine just goes down smoothly. I mean, he, this is just one suave, debonair guy. I mean, he is Mr. Cool. You know what I'm saying? And, he, and so she sees him and describes this idea. Oh, look at him. He is so debonair. He's so elegant. Even when he drinks. The wine just goes down smoothly, moving gently the lips of the sleepers. And again, back in the context way back when, the idea of the sleepers often was the, describing the teeth. And so as he lifts that glass of wine to his mouth, his lips part, and the wine just kind of flows into his mouth and over his teeth. And she's just, just overcome by this smoothness of her man. And so that, might, that is one uh, possibility that she sees him and is describing his smoothness, if you will. Secondly, and, and moving gently the lips of the sleepers, it might be that she's describing, again, it's very difficult to really translate this Hebrew, but it might be that even the way he sips his wine, 
He is so elegant that it even awakes the one who sleeps. This man arrests attention. Remember previously when the Shulamite was describing her man? She said, oh, if he were in a room of 10,000 other men, you would pick him out without any trouble. And so there again, that might be her description at this point. You know, sh this guy, he even awakes the one that's sleeping. He, he draws the attention of all, but he's mine. And that's what she's reminiscing on. And so there's a couple of ideas here. We're not exactly sure, uh, but back then it made sense when this was being put together. And, and so again, we're, we're doing our best here, but we're going to move on. And But what she concludes, and we see clearly in verse 10, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. She knows. He is hers. Remember at first, when we first went through the first couple of chapters, and, she, and the Shulamite was saying, oh, don't look upon me, I'm dark. Or don't look upon me, I'm a person of the soil. But now, in her confidence, on her honeymoon, as she is gazing upon her husband, she is saying, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. She's very confident now. Why? Because he has poured into her prior to their wedding. And now, at the honeymoon, she says, man, I know that we are one. The two shall become one, as we saw early on in Genesis. And she knows his desire is toward me. Oh, he's a great-looking guy, and the whole town loves him. But you know what? He's mine. That's what she's saying. Come, my beloved. Let us go forth to the field. Now, this would appear that we've moved past the honeymoon, the time of discovery and such. Now, uh, uh, the next day or maybe a couple of days, whatever the case may be. But come, my beloved, let's go forth to the field. And so day is, uh, day is dawned, what have you. Hey, let's go. Let's go out and, and, and run around. Let us lodge in the villages. Let's go, to, let's go on our, our honeymoon trip, if you will. It's very important for a newlywed couple to take that time as David was being commanded as he was putting together his armies, he was commanded by the Lord, find out who is a newlywed. Who's the newlywed couple? And you leave that man behind for one year. He is not to come and join the army until he has spent that, the next 12 months with his newly wedded wife to get to know her. While I was in Israel, I had the real pleasure, our tour guide was a colonel in the Israeli army at the time. And he ex we were talking a little bit, of course, as, as the, the, the time went on. But he, he explained, he said, oh, no, we he said, you Westerners, you, you just you run to Vegas and get married, and that's it. But he's explaining to me, he says, in our Hebrew culture, in the, the Israeli culture, oh, we court. And you have chaperones for months, if not years, as the couple would be courting. And then once the, the, the marriage uh, would, would finally come together and the honeymoon, he was emphasizing, then there was a, after the marriage, there was a 12-month time together where the couple would cohabitate, of course, but they would learn without any pressure the, the, the neighboring village would basically take care of their daily needs. Food and lodging and things like that were basically taken care of. So this newly wedded couple could get to know one another. And so that's what we see here. Come, my beloved, let's go. Let's go discover. Let's, let's, have our, let's begin our life together. Let us lodge in the villages. Verse 12, let us get up early to the vineyards. Let's travel. Let's go visit. Let us see if the vine has budded. Speaking about the springtime and, and really just rejoicing in her marriage. Let us go up, get up early. Let's see if the vine has budded. Let's see whether the grape blossoms are open and the pomegranates are in bloom. Let's go. Let's go discover. Let's frolic. Let's have some time. There, when we get to an, this particular place that she is describing, then she boldly says, there I will give you my love. 
I'll give you myself once again, completely. The woman is not afraid of saying, hey, I want to initiate this. I want to put this into your head, my husband, because I know that's going to catch your attention. And she is bold. Hey, let's go travel. But then when we get to the particular spot, there I will give you my love. I will give you myself once again physically. Look forward to that. This is the Lord, this is God the Holy Spirit writing this. These are the things that we need to learn about in our own relationships with one another. So there I will give you my love when we get to our destination. I'll be glad. I look forward to it myself. It's going to be great. The mandrakes give off a fragrance. Now mandrakes, we see early in the Old Testament that mandrakes are an aphrodisiac, if you will. Now, whether that's scientifically true or not, I don't really know. But the idea here, the mandrakes give off a fragrance. And what she is saying, the mandrakes, this particular flowering plant, gives off a fragrance that will arrest our attention. And it'll draw us in that love. And so the mandrakes, as the mandrakes give off a fragrance, let's submit ourselves to that, that aphrodisiac. At our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner, new and old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. I have kept myself for you, my husband. That's one of the things with our daughter, we made sure that she understood you have a gift and we want to help you. Mom and dad want to help you keep and guard that gift for your husband. Who's your husband? I don't know. But I promise you when I meet Margot's future husband, I'm going to sit him down and say, young man, I appreciate you coming and letting me know that you'd like to marry my daughter, but I want to make something very clear. Once you take the hand of my daughter, She's yours. There's no return policy. So why don't you go ahead and scoot on home and think about what I have just clearly said to you, my young friend. And it's going to be crystal clear. If you take her, it's a one-time deal. And that's going to be okay. I, I mean, I've rehearsed it, you know, 15 times in my head. <laughs> It's okay. I'm good. I'm good with it. <laughs> but when Margo was 14, in fact, Connie just pulled up the, the video that we had done. At Margo's 16th birthday, I gave her a promise ring. And, and Connie and I kept the other one saying, hey, we promise that we're going to help you remain pure. That's our promise, mom and dad, to our daughter. We're going we're gonna to work with you pray for you, and allow you to make good decisions. And that's what we find the Shulamite woman saying, hey, I have kept myself. I have kept myself, and we'll qualify that here in a moment in chapter 8, but let's move on to verse 1 in chapter 8. And she continues on and says, oh, that you were like my brother who nursed at my mother's breast. Now, we saw a little bit of this last time in the old culture to be physically displaying love to a brother or a sister publicly was a normal thing. I mean, a, a, a brotherly or sisterly kiss in public and things like this and very close-knit with spouses and things, not spouses, but with siblings is what I meant. With siblings was very common. And it wasn't so much that you'd see mom and dad, you know, smooching and things like that. But the brothers and the sisters would be a little more affectionate toward one another physically, uh, excuse me, publicly. And that was accepted. And so she's saying, oh, that I wish you were like my brother because then I could be a little more public with my affection toward you. And that's, what, that's the idea here. Oh, I wish you were like my brother. I could be a little more casual. But we've got to kind of maintain uh, because, because of our cultural relationship and such. 
And she goes on to say, if I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. I would lead you, and now she's speaking now from a spousal point of, point of view. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. So I'd bring you to come and introduce you to my mom. Where's dad? I'm not quite sure, but again, just poetically she's speaking, I'm sure. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. She is the one who used to instruct me. She is the one that told me how to conduct myself. So I would come and I would want to introduce you, my beloved, to my mom. That's what I, would, that's what I want to do. I would cause you to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. And now to the daughters of Jerusalem, the onlookers, the friends of the Shulamite woman, to the friends of the Shulamite, friends, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me, probably in a very physical fashion, if you could imagine. So again, under the guise of marriage. But yet she goes on to say, yes, this is what I am experiencing from my husband, but I charge you, my girlfriends, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. We've heard this a couple of times now in this letter, haven't we? In this book. The Shulamite woman is reminding her friends, hey, don't push the physical barrier until you're married. Let it wait. Oh yes, I've, I've engaged now with my spouse, but, I'm, but I want you to know, we kept ourselves pure. So do not stir up nor awaken love until it's time. Don't tempt yourself. Now perhaps a, re now a relative here, perhaps a brother, or maybe a couple of the brothers of the Shulamite, they're responding, who is this coming up from the wilderness? I mean, they know who it is, but they're seeing this now. They, they used to see this little sister of theirs, but now all of a sudden she's a woman, and they're looking at her saying, wow, who's this? Kind of like the day that I woke up and walked into my living room, and all of a sudden there was a woman in my house, and I realized it was my daughter. I thought, my goodness, what happened? You know, it used to be like eight years old. You know, now you're a, a, a lady. And frankly, it kind of caught me by surprise. I was like, whoa. And that's what the response is. Hey, hey who, is this, who is this woman? I mean, they know who she is. She's like, wow. The, the, the fellows are saying, the, the brothers are saying, whoa. Look at this. Coming out of the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved. She's a married woman now. Whoa. How did that happen? I remember I awakened you under the apple tree. I remember we used to goof off. We used to go out in the field as brother and sister, and we used to goof around and have fun. We'd take a nap under the apple tree. Remember those days? And, and the brothers are now, now look at her. She's on the arm of this handsome, this handsome man. Whoa, how'd that happen? There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. So mom presented. Much like in our customs today, dad presents the daughter in the wedding ceremony. Now again, where's dad? I'm not sure. There's no explanation. But again, we, we continue to move on. And so the Shulamite, the, the gal continues speaking to her, her beloved once again. She says to her husband, set me as a seal upon your heart. As a seal upon your arm. Let me be a permanent fixture on your arm. Is what she's saying. I just want to hang on that mighty arm of yours. For love is as strong as death. I mean, we see the context, but we can also see the power of both. Love always wanting, oh, drawing you in. And the same with death, in a way. Always drawing, never satisfied, as, the, as, as Solomon said in the proverb. But love is exactly that way, oh, just always drawing us in. Furthermore, jealousy is as cruel as the grave. 
Do you recognize that God is a jealous God? He's jealous for you and I. He wants to be our one and only. And he's jealous about that. And it's a good thing. Oprah has a problem with that. But I don't. God is jealous. He said, you're mine. And I won't let you go. Because I'm jealous for you. In a good way. I want you. I love you. As we sing these worship songs, love unto the Lord, he is actually whispering right back, saying, oh, I love you, and you are mine. I'm jealous for you, and I will fight for you. I, I can vouch for that. As I ran from the Lord for over 20 years, he never left me, ever. He was jealous and is jealous to this day for you and I. And he demonstrates that as long as we take a moment long enough to rest and to meditate on that, then we will be reminded. And you know what I'm talking about. So jealousy, it's as cruel as the, as, as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. I mean, this is what love, she's describing love. I just can't take it. I've got to be with you, is what she's saying. I've got to be with you. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. Furthermore, if a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. What she's saying here in a poetic way, you cannot put a price on love. You could give everything you own, but it wouldn't be enough. It would be a, min a minimal amount. Wouldn't be enough. All the money in the world wouldn't be enough. And that's what she's saying. Even if you give all the wealth of your house, it would be utterly despised. It's not enough. You just got to commit and submit. She's saying, I'm going to submit myself to you. There's no price on love. I'm just going to give my all. Isn't that the way Jesus wants us? He wants our all. He wants our all. That's all he wants, is everything. That's it. <laughs> Man, that takes a life, a lifetime to work through that challenge. Speaking for myself, I, I wrestle with it every day. Every morning I wake up and say, all right, Lord, what would you like today? He said, I want everything. I want all of you. I'm like, oh, man, Lord, you got to help me in that. you got to help me. He said, don't worry, I'm with you. I said, okay, deal. And that's the way we start our day. There's no price on love. I want it all. So reminiscing, the Shulamites brothers recall. Once again, they kind of go back in their minds. Yes, we have a little sister. Yeah, she's just a little scrawny little girl. She has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she is spoken for? Now, if she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. So if she keeps herself like a wall in the physical regard, we can build on that. We will encourage that. If she's a wall, no one comes through, no one penetrates a wall. So we have this little sister, and we've told her, hey, if you remain a wall, we can fortify that. We will be with you. We will support you and we will build upon your decision. Yet if, if she is a door or a gate, something that opens and closes, if that's what she decides to do, we, the brother speaking, will enclose her with the boards of cedar. If that's the way she's going to operate, if she's going to be like a swinging gate or a door, we will put her on a tight leash, quite literally, is what the Hebrew is saying. We will enclose her. We will bind her up, quite literally. Again, the difference, the, the wall, great. Impenetrable. But if she wants to become a door, uh-uh. We're not letting her out of our sight, is what the, the, boys are, the brothers are saying. We will enclose her. So the Shulamite responds, I am a wall. I'm a wall. I, I've decided, uh, that's it. 
I am a wall and my breasts are like towers. Now, it's not speaking about her physical appearance. She's just speaking when you, when you would see a wall in these Old Testament times, there'd always be towers, watchtowers. And, and that's all she's saying here poetically. Hey, I'm a wall. I'm solid. I'm good. Then, I, at the proper time, I became in his eyes as one who found peace. Speaking about her beloved. When the time came... I was the one, I was as one who found peace. Solomon, she goes on to say, had a vineyard at Baal Haman. So in other words, Solomon has a vineyard that's of value. He leased this vineyard to the keepers. Everyone was to, br to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. And so she's explaining Solomon has a valuable piece of property that he leases out and people pay him, pay him his rent and such. And now she says to her beloved, to Solomon in verse 12, my own vineyard is before me. She's now point, directing his attention to her physically saying, this is yours, this is a value, and I'm giving it to you. I haven't given it to anyone else. I'm giving it to you. My own vineyard is before me. You, O oh Solomon may have a thousand, and those who tend its fruit, two hundred. Yet, the beloved responds, Solomon responds, you who dwell in the gardens, the companions listen for your voice. Oh, my Shulamite woman, let me hear your voice. And the Shulamite responds as we close. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. And so as we close this book tonight, it would appear that as they had been in their married, married state, as life would pick back up, perhaps after those 12 months, what have you, and they got back to a bit of a routine, it would appear as we have these last couple of verses, it would appear that Solomon came and said, hey, I've got to go on a business trip. And I've got to go take care of business. And she understood this. I mean, that's just the way uh, the world is. And he says, you know, I've got to go. But let me hear your voice. And she responds, oh, go do your business, but make haste, make haste like a gazelle, like a young stag, and hurry back at the appointed time. And I can't wait to see you once again. What a great letter, isn't it? A beautiful, beautiful little book that is sometimes maybe perhaps misrepresented or even just sort of ignored. But it's been a real joy that we've been able to share it with one another. Amen. If I could ask the worship team to come join me. It has been a real joy to sit with Solomon. We've sat with Solomon through the Proverbs, through the book of Ecclesiastes, and now we've just finished the Song of Solomon. We recall that Solomon, the wisest man in the world, as the Lord had commanded King David, Solomon's dad, said, David, you are to position your son Solomon on the throne. David, he's my man. As David, you are my man, but I'm going to take you home. And now you're going to set Solomon. And as Solomon approached that kingly throne, Solomon humbled himself before the Lord and said, Lord, this is a great people that you want me to oversee, and I can't do it on my own. Lord, you give me the wisdom to minister to your people. And the Lord said, Solomon, you didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for a long life. You asked for wisdom. And not only will I make you the wisest man in the world, but I'll make you the richest man, and I'll allow you to live in peace for many, many years to come. And Solomon did reign in peace. He had his ups and downs, as we've seen. But the Lord acknowledged Solomon, and we've had the privilege to do the same. Amen? Next time, as, as the Lord tarries, we're going to open up the book of Isaiah. Read ahead. God has got some things to say to the nation of, of, of Israel through what we call one of the major prophets, Isaiah.
Good stuff, good lessons for us to be aware of. But read ahead as you see fit, amen? Join us by standing. Let's go out praising the Lord, shall we? Hi, everybody. Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos, and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But, you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you, since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we want to challenge you, why not share these videos? You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much, and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.